Hello and welcome to this presentation about new skills for project managers in the fourth industrial revolution. My name is Thomas Jelmy and I look forward to talking to you about this very important topic over the next round about 30 minutes. To begin with, I'd like to say a few words about myself. I have been supporting leaders in various industries across the globe, across cultures, um, and on different levels of leadership in their personal and interpersonal development, which of course is relevant wherever people want to or have to achieve things together. So in leadership, in teamwork, and in customer relations. Now, why should we talk about new skills in project management or in leadership in general? Well, mainly because we live in a VUCA world. Now, what does that mean? VUCA is an acronym that stands for the four main challenges that over the past few decades, organizations and their leaders have had to increasingly increasingly face. V stands for volatility. We see an almost insanely increasing speed of change in almost all markets, in almost all areas of life. Things change more and more quickly and more and more often. U stands for uncertainty. We can't really plan anymore for larger time horizons. We don't know what will be tomorrow, what will be next week. So uncertainty is growing. C stands for complexity. Again, in almost all areas of life, complexity is increasing dramatically. And last but not least, ambiguity. Contradicting goals, contradicting projects, where maybe years ago there was right and wrong, very obviously. We may now have a big gray area in between and it's much harder to make clear decisions. So among this VUCA environment, we have seen various trends emerging over the past years, one of them being the fourth industrial revolution that comes with automation, increased connectivity, cloud computing, internet of things, big data system integration, and many other aspects. Now, in this big, big trend, in which digitalization is also a big part, of course, the digital maturity is key, the maturity of an organization, and committed employees are a key in those organizations. Now, it may be obvious that companies with a high level of digital maturity are remarkably more profitable than those with a low level of maturity. But this is not only about technology. What really counts are committed and engaged employees who actually support this digital strategy. It's the people who will make it run or who won't. This puts managers and leaders in the focus as the linchpin for change. So in a nutshell, it is about much more than just technological change. And paradoxically, we will not necessarily win the digital race by only mastering technology, which is of course an important aspect and part of it, but by becoming more human, or at least by not losing the human factors and human aspects in working with people and in leading our employees. Why is that? This is about digitalization. This is about the fourth industrial revolution. So why should we talk about people? Well, it's very simple. 
Because regardless of whether you're in the B2B business or in the B2C business, it's always H to H. It's humans working with other humans. It's humans deciding to support other humans, to say yes, to lead others, to collaborate well. So it's all about connecting. It's all about synchronizing on the relationship level. It's about building trust. It's about building relationships and also maintaining those relationships even under difficult circumstances and conditions. Now you may think, well, I do that. And it's also not, it's not rocket science. It's easy to understand if you look at it. But when we look at what's happening or what happens in organizations across the world, we see that many, many communicate, many exchange information, exchange data, but only few really, truly connect with others. Now, what is the answer to VUCA or to a VUCA environment? The answer or one of the answers to VUCA is that we need to empower people. Because in a VUCA environment, you cannot make all the decisions yourself anymore. You cannot control everything yourself. You cannot micromanage, although some try. So when we used to need people in the past who did what they were told to do, today and in the future, we need people who do what they're not told to do or what they're not being told, right? People who think for themselves, who are engaged, who are enthusiastic, who do what needs to be done because they want to do it. That's what we need. Now, this of course brings a new kind of leadership quality to the stage and some leadership competencies. Now, I brought a little collection here of leadership skills in the digital age. It's the results of a meta study that was recently done. So a study that combined many, many other studies. They were looking at the most important leadership skills in the digital age. And I have hidden number one and number two. So what you see here is number three downwards. And you see things like interconnectivity, transparency, team working skills, media competence, uh, the gray ones being the more analog skills and the olive green ones being the more digital skills. Now guess what the two most important leadership skills are in the digital age and also in the fourth industrial revolution? Well, here they are. Communication skills, by far the most important, with 70%, followed by human orientation. So being human is key because we're dealing with human beings. Now, if we look at the two mostly known forms of intelligence, which one do you think becomes increasingly important? I'm sure you all know intellectual intelligence, also known as IQ, but there's also EQ, emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence includes or encompasses the ability to be aware of your own emotions and be in control of your own emotions, but also being aware and empathetically noticing other people's emotions and being able to handle them and work with them in a um, empathetic, compassionate and productive way. So if we look at the four main areas of competence 
and at the skill sets needed for effective leadership nowadays. There are, as I said, four technical skills, of course, everything you have to know and, and, and be able to accomplish on a technical level. Methodological skills, knowing when to apply what method to successfully accomplish something. Interpersonal skills, the ability to connect with others, build relationships and maintain those relationships, but also influencing others, mobilizing others to do what needs to be done because they want to do it. And personal skills. Now guess which of those four become increasingly important? And yes, of course, you know it by now. It's interpersonal skills and personal skills. Now, the interpersonal skills may be obvious by now, but why personal skills? Well, this is very simple, actually. Just like in nature, where there is nothing that doesn't grow from the inside out, good leadership is mostly good self-leadership. So how can you be an inspiring, compassionate uh, leader that mobilizes others to do what needs to be done because they want to do it if you yourself are not connected with yourself, you're not in touch with yourself, you're not self-aware, you are not in control of your inner weather conditions, so to speak. So the journey begins within. Now let's look at this a bit more closely. Self-awareness is key. Our visible behavior or the, our own behavior that we are aware of and the behavior of others that we perceive can be seen as the tip of an iceberg, the visible part. This behavior is driven by some aspects that are very often in the unconscious realm. So we're unaware of them. Short term, our, in, our behavior is influenced by our inner reactions to what's happening, by our, the stories we are telling ourselves, the thinking about what's happening, and as I already mentioned, the inner weather conditions, my inner emotional state. This has a direct impact and will manifest in my behavior, short term, and also quite volatile throughout the day. Long term, our behavior is driven and influenced by our value system, by the respective beliefs based on our values, by our experiences, and by our needs. Values, typically things like respect, um, appreciation, honesty, loyalty, quality, perfection, speed, result orientation, can be anything and varies from person to person. We all have our individual value systems that we're very often not aware of. The beliefs are related to the values, are based on the values. So for example, if one of my values is quality, perfection, then the corresponding belief is probably something like, if we do this or if we do something or anything, we do it right or not at all. And then the needs we have as human beings. Among the most important needs we have and that are relevant, especially in leadership and collaboration, are the need for self-esteem, for feeling valued and respected and appreciated for who we are as a person, the need for autonomy and control, being able to make my own decisions, the ones I can make, the need for orientation, clarity, guidance, and the need for attachment. So because of all of these aspects being in or below the waterline, we are very often on autopilot or in autopilot mode, driven. 
And the key is really to lower that water line so that more of the lower parts of the iceberg become visible for us and we come, become aware of them so we can work with them and more deliberately act and more intentionally do the things that are effective in our leadership. Because only what we're aware of, we can control. What we're not aware of controls us. And that's important because imagine now what happens when two icebergs meet. For example, a leader and a team member, a project manager and a team member, or any other stakeholder or a group of people. The interaction happens on two levels. It happens very obviously on the factual level. That's the level of exchange where we share information, where we have discussions, um, the facts and figures, the tasks, responsibilities, etc. That's usually where the focus is in our daily interactions in the workplace. But much of this interaction is also happening on the relational level. Emotions are in place. How we feel about the meeting, how we feel about each other. Do we feel respected? Do we feel disrespected? Do I feel offended by what you just said? Or do I feel valued and included? Do I feel heard? Can I say what's on my mind and still feel safe? All of these things are there and they have a huge influence on the quality of this interaction on the factual level. But very often because they again are below the waterline and nobody's really paying attention to them because we think the facts and figures are what's important here. Many of these things uh, remain unnoticed. But when you look at a real iceberg floating in the ocean, just imagine for a moment, what is it that moves the iceberg? Is it the winds blowing against the tip or is it the currents below the waterline that move the iceberg? Well, I think the answer is clear. Maybe on a stormy day, the wind has its share in mobilizing and moving this iceberg about but it's mostly the currents below the waterline. And you can take this image and really transfer it into real life and human interaction. The main influencing happens on the relationship level. And leadership is influencing others. Let's face it, it's leadership is making things happen, mobilizing people to decide things, to do things, to act. So this happens on the relationship level. If I feel respected, if I feel good, if I feel like I'm part of this team and I contribute and what I do is important, I will do more than is required. I'll go extra miles. If instead I feel disrespected, I feel used as an instrument and not much more than that. It doesn't even matter what I say and what I think because it's, it's not being heard. Or there are any other negative emotions or irritations on the relationship level, it will become increasingly difficult to effectively work together on the factual level because there are roadblocks um, on the relationship level, closed doors. All right, so same here. The goal is to lower the waterline and make these things transparent. Talk about it, have it on the table so you can work with it and clear the air and create a positive emotional climate uh, for collaboration and teamwork. So the neuroscientific uh, background of this can be summarized in one sentence, a quote by renowned Canadian uh, neuroscientist Donald Kahn, who said, the essential difference between emotion and reason is that emotion leads to action, while reason leads to conclusions. So you may ask yourself, or you may want to ask yourself, what is it that you really need or you really want at the end of your meetings, your interactions with your 
project teams? Do you want them to come to conclusions and understand what needs to be done and why it needs to be done? Is this good enough? Or do you want them to leave the meeting enthusiastically and fully motivated to do what needs to be done because they can't wait to start doing it? That's a completely different story. Or in other words, the emotional energy in, 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 the, in the positive sense of the word, as in enthusiasm, should increase towards the end of a meeting. Very often it's the other way around. People come to the meeting motivated, engaged, enthusiastic, and they leave the meeting disillusioned. So flip this around 180 degrees and see the magic happen. And you can also imagine this uh, uh, very simply as, you know, having an emotional balance sheet in any stakeholder relationship you have. With some people you work with, the balance sheet is in the plus because the predominant emotions in this work relationship are positive. Great guy, great person. Every time you come out of the meeting, you think, wow, that's exactly how I like uh, working with others. And then there are the others, where the balance sheet is in the minus. Every time you come out of a meeting with this person, you, you're oh, drained of your energy and you feel bad, or, or you just think, oh my goodness, why is this so difficult, right, with this person? And, and the, the relationship is running in the credit limit, so to speak until the credit is used up at some point. So the balance, this emotional balance is, or has a direct impact on our decision-making. So if, I, if, if the balance sheet is positive, it's in the plus, I feel valued, respected, it's great to work together, you will see engagement, cooperation, support, and trust. If the negative emotions are predominant, you see uncooperative behavior, you see silo thinking, you see pushback. No, your problem, sorry. And emotional stress. And people do things because they have to do them to avoid problems, but not really because they are driven internally and intrinsically motivated. So you may wanna sit down and take a moment after this presentation and think of your emotional balance sheets. What, what do your emotional balance sheets look like with your key stakeholders, with the members of your project team? And what could you do to change the trend so that it will start becoming more positive. What can you do? How can you contribute? Sometimes it's very small things, like showing more interest, listening more genuinely to understand. All right, this brings me to the main conclusions. Number one, what really counts are committed and engaged employees. The main influencing in mobilizing others happens on the relationship level. Facts and figures are important, yes, but the music plays on the relationship level. Human orientation is a key leadership skill, and this includes emotional intelligence towards yourself and others, and the ability to truly authentically connect. It is therefore a leader's responsibility to consistently create a positive and safe climate of trust, no matter what, no matter how the project is going, especially if the project is not going well. And the ability to do this begins with increased self-awareness and self 
leadership. So I would like to encourage you to yeah, look into that more deeply. Who are you as a leader? Who would you like to be as a leader? And try or strive for becoming the leader you always wished to have. Thank you very much for listening and for watching. It's been a pleasure for me to record this presentation. Please feel free to reach out to me and connect with me either personally or on social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, wherever you like. Thank you and all the best.